Hello and welcome to Outsider Gaming. I'm joined today by the wonderful Khaled Jones. Uh, I'm your host, Paul, by the way, in case you don't know me. Khaled is kind of, if you was to read his resume, it would be, it would put me to shame, to be fair. It's fairly uh, full. Uh, he's a busy man. From kind of his early days, uh, finishing Stanford University, he went into, you know, something really simple like law, uh, became an attorney, uh, was looking at things like securities legis legislation. Um, from there, he has been involved in investment groups and firms, looking at things like tech and sports and the media. He is also a co-founder of the Clear Group, I'm probably mispronouncing that, but you can correct me in a sec. Um, and you know, is here today, hopefully, to talk mostly about his new co-founder role, which is with the wonderful Ultimate Playlist app, which he co-founded with Chevy. So, Kelly, can you tell me a bit about, you know, how do you go from, uh, you know, jumping from stepping zone to stepping zone? How do you end up where you are now with Ultimate Playlist? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, you know, when I, I graduated from college and went straight to law school, so by the time I graduated law school, I was 24 and went straight to being a lawyer in New York at you know big firms and working on really very interesting cutting edge uh, cases in the securities world. But I always took my institutions as a license to explore and to create and to take chances. Um, and that's what I that's what I've done in my career. And I've been you know, pretty happy with that. So after I, I left a uh, uh, law firm uh, practice, I was involved in politics. I ran a campaign. Uh, um, and then started an asset management company um, with a friend of mine who was coming out of the, the, the hedge fund world. We started a hedge fund and a mutual fund um, uh, back then. I went back into law firm practice, so, so took that securities um, ethos uh, with me back into some private in a private company that we had a startup. You know, we were 26 and 27 with a, a startup a mutual fund. We put a billboard up in Times Square. Um, you know, we were doing it right. We were, and and then. I'm not sure how where where you were in 2008, but that was the big market crash then. Uh, so went back to went back to to, to law firm uh, practice then. But the idea of of creation, um, the idea of um, of ideating, the idea of innovation, of invention, uh, that was always there, and it's almost like stamped into the very ethos of the institutions that I came from. And certainly, when I look out at the world, um, the kind of questions that I want to be uh, asking and answering. Yeah, I I was nearly going to say it. It sounds like you're you're nearly picking up skills as you go, so you can be more creative and make new things. That's ex that's exactly right. And so you know, from from my perspective, it all draws a line through. So um, when when I left uh, firm practice at the last time in tw in 2012, um, I founded an investment company um, with someone who I went to college with at Wake Forest um, and another uh, acquaintance of his. And, and we, we really had little C Catholic interests. We, we were involved in asking the questions, how can we add to any number of fields? So whether that was, you know, we had straight equity investments for sure, but mm -hmm. whether that was in the real estate world. And then we also looked into the entertainment and gaming space. And that's when I was truly uh, introduced outside of being, you know, being a kid and, you know, playing yeah. that, playing game, but really introduced into the true business side, innovation side of what gaming could be. And we we came together and um, were part of a larger group to make one of the um, initial, um, you know, sort of professional investments um, in the esports space um, into a team at the time. Um, and so, you know, uh, partnering with Riot and, you know, working yeah. in those those in those leagues and dealing with the players and the contracts and the leagues, you know, that was really um, a time to bring all those skills um, together to bear and was my, my real uh, foray and jumping in with two feet um, into yeah. the game space. Um, and that was really how um, I was introduced to, uh, at that point in time, the director of the Arizona State Lottery, Greg Edgar, um, who they were trying to think about what this new world meant for the lottery space. Um, yeah. and, and they have certain restrictions. You know, they, they can't, the, there are certain states in America, not a lot of people know this, um, but most states in America, the lotteries cannot sell lottery online. Only a handful can. Arizona yeah. was one was one that was one that couldn't. And he asked uh, me whether or not, you know, had some ideas uh, to deal with that. So the ultimate playlist was really the outgrowth of some really creative thinking by me and a, a larger group of people that really met 
uh, a need um, from an innovative thinker and an innovative group of thinkers at the Arizona State Lottery. And we were able to add all the years of combined experience. And there's like a joke when people ask about why, you know, uh, certain fields, you know, why does architect, why are they $800 an hour? You're not actually paying for the $800 an hour. You're paying for all the years of experience that came before yeah. that. So it felt like something like the ultimate playlist was really the culmination of a lot of people's hard work, thinking, dedication, need, and innovation and mm -hmm. experience all coming together. Yeah. So speaking of the ultimate playlist, for anyone that's watching today, I mean, they might not know. Anyone outside of the United States might not know what it is. So exactly. what is the ultimate playlist? So here's so the ultimate playlist in a nutshell. So we'll, we'll go we'll go one sentence and then we'll, we'll go deep. The down. elevator pitch. Give me yeah, the elevator. Exactly. Uh, pretend I'm investing in you. <laughs> well, the ultimate playlist is the the the, the first ever uh, gamified um, music discovery app with a chance to win real money. So yeah. in a in a, in a sentence, that's it. So the mechanics of it though is we essentially we 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 put out a playlist of music every day. Right now it's a group of 40 songs that play every day, um, different songs every day. Um, and the more you listen, the more um, tickets you accrue that go into a raffle at the end for real money prizes. Um, and so there's sort of two games that get played. One is a daily uh, raffle. So there's 18 guaranteed prizes between 50 and $500 that people win every day. And then if you accrue uh, enough uh, entries, you have a chance at uh, winning, which is now $65,000. It starts at $20,000 and grows. 20, 5, yeah, that's what I thought. 20, and yeah. Grows, grows $5,000 every month. And right now wow. it's up to 55,000. So that grand prize that hangs out there, um, that there's a chance to win. And that and that's sort of a Powerball style game if you recruit enough mm -hmm. entries for that. So what we wanted to do though, was give people a way that they're listening can be rewarded um, in a way that feels gamified, but is absolutely free to play. Um, yeah. And so that is, that's sort of a couple of the linchpins there is that it's free to play, that you're still discovering music and there's a lot of different ways to earn tickets. So every 30 seconds you listen to a song, you earn a ticket. If you listen for a minute, you earn another ticket. If you add the song to your Apple music, you earn a ticket. If you, wow. uh, if you rate the song, we don't care what you rate it, just the act of rating it earns a ticket. Mm -hmm. So we want people to be engaged in listening to the songs, but that actually their listenership can turn into mm -hmm. something um, that's more than just, I like that song. Absolutely. It sounds quite exciting. Like on our website, we, we have a full section kind of dedicated to different kind of, you know, sweepstakes and casinos and slot games and all these different, you know, kind of gambling things you do. But this yeah. isn't really that. This sounds like it's more interactive. It's more about, uh, you know, getting engaged. And it sounds like it would appeal to the gamers, you know, the people who wants to get on that leaderboard because I know you do have a leaderboard there that people kind of you know bragging rights that I'm I'm top of the leaderboard because I'm engaging more than anyone else that's exactly yeah. right well it, and when it came out of you know we had a very distinct the question that came out of the Arizona lottery when we were first starting this is how do we connect with culture how do we give people a gaming experience how do we reach down to people who consider themselves gamers while still appealing to a, a broader audience. And so we thought that this was a good way to connect with culture and you're absolutely right. Um, things like the leaderboard, which we're even looking for ways to make it more robust. Right now, it really serves as a vehicle, kind of like um, you know the Pac-Man leaderboard or any kind of leaderboards that we have in, in gaming now where it's sort of bragging rights. Um, but some of the evolutions in the game we have will make those not just bragging rights, but also sort of integral to the way that people earn within the game itself. So we're looking to take all the cues from what I consider uh, traditional gaming um, and bring it into this sort of free to play space into that larger uh, lottery space. And it's sort of our first uh, foray. Um, and I'll add on, on top of that, you know, what, what, what we have done with this, the technology that it sits under. We applied for, this was however many, several years ago, back in 2020, um, a patent. We're actually having a patent issue for the tech that under, underlies it this upcoming very good. Yeah. Exciting. So was, very exciting. Very, very good. And tell me, so obviously you're kind of the, I suppose, the business person behind it all with, with that kind of knowledge. And then when you look at Chevy, like she's obviously the the music side of things um so how does that collaboration work or, or in fact how did you even kind of meet and, and come up with this 
Yeah, so I'm, you know, I, I think, you know, everybody at some point in time, whether or not they work in the creative space or not, has some sort of fledgling creative in them. I've always been involved, just not only as a lover of music, a creator of music. Um, and so when um, I met Chevy, this was I mean, many, many, many years ago um, uh, that we met. Um, she was obviously very, very, very talented musically, but it was very evident very early on um, that her focus was how does that talent translate into the broader context of the uh, music industry. So our conversations, yes, surrounded music and music itself and how do you break artists and do all those other things. Um, but when we started Elite Shout, um, the idea was how do we use technology? How do we view trends? How do we look out with a lens of the future to understand where the industry is going? Whether that was when I was in college, the shift from CDs to Napster and then on to Spotify um, and, you know, for people being sort of left behind in that process. Um, and we saw a similar process taking shape um, on music promotion side, right? It's no longer wheat pastings um, and physical promotions with promotion trucks going around the city. It's obviously evolved into very sophisticated playlisting. Um, and, and how do we then insert um, certain pieces of technology and sort of future casting into that process. Um, yeah. So Chevy has been really integral into understanding sort of the mind of the musician as we move along through all of these parts. Um, and then, you know, she's been extraordinarily integral just in, in project managing the build of the app itself um, and has dove in with both feet on that, both feet. Wow. Yeah, and you, you mentioned, so, I mean, it's it's very obvious the players, what they're getting from it. You know, they they have all these chances to be entered into this competition and to, to win their cash prizes. Um, and the more they put in, the more chances they have. The musician side of it. So, you know, you're obviously picking up artists and you're cherry picking songs. What are those magi uh, magicians, musicians getting out of this? Um, I, I assume exposure is one thing. Um, what, is there anything else? Yeah, well, well, what we hope is to try to create, if you start with the premise that it's music discovery on one side for the listeners, then there's obviously got to be musicians who are being discovered. And so yeah. what we're trying to create um, is sort of a closed system. So for example, right now, if if you've got a song right now, Paul, you and I, we make a song, we'll come in, we'll come into my studio right here. You and I, we make a song, we put it out. First of all, there are Chevy always keeps up the updated numbers there's, or there's hundreds of thousands of songs a day being put out onto the onto Spotify and literally yeah. hundreds of thousands, 80 million something a year. So, I mean, if you think about it in, in that terms, it's literally almost impossible for any one song to be discovered outside of of the large of the large system. So we said, well, yeah. how do you create something um, that makes it a little bit more specific than that? So right now, if we try to go on a playlist. Um, first of all, you have to know the playlist exists. Maybe the playlist is 100 songs, 100 songs long, and you're 98th on it. And so even if someone discovers a playlist, maybe you never get played. So we said, well, what if we created a limited playlist and give people a reason to listen to it? Um, and so from the artist side, um, they can see that, well, first of all, there's only going to be 40 songs. Second of all, algorithmically, if let's say a million people are listening to the playlist simultaneously, we've got a million daily users. Let's hope we get there, right? Um, yeah. Every playlist is going to come in a different order. So there's no chance that if your song is on there and you're 38th on the list, that you're 38th on everyone's list. So you have a chance yeah. to be first on first, even a yeah. number of lists on all the lists. So there's that. And then also, like you said, uh, the exposure of what, of, of what the algorithm does within the playlist. So one of the things we say is, we can make people listen to your song. We can't make you like it. So because of what we're using, because of the incentives that we're using, so that 30 seconds, you get a ticket. A minute, you get a ticket. If you do this, if you listen to the whole song, you get bonus. Yeah. We're, in we're creating micro incentives along the way to continue listening. And we see our engagement is really large because of that. The time spent listening is very high because of that. And the other thing that we see is if you take a small, what we would call relatively small artist, and you put their stats in the playlist up against a better known artist and you make it blind, it's virtually identical because we've created incentives for people to listen to your song and continue to listen to your song. So ultimately what we want out of the ultimate playlist is for it to be a promotional vehicle for if you're going to spend marketing dollars in you know, one part of the music world, you should spend some of that here at the ultimate playlist because we've created a system where the players win you win and we can tell you what your money is going towards in terms of statistics listenership etc really the yeah. data very good very good 